Hello, and thank you for joining AO On Air. In this episode, we're actually going to do a little bit different format. Uh, we had the opportunity a few weeks ago to record a session with two customers, uh, TD Bank's Card Services and AIG's Retirement Services, in partnership with our uh, partner of ours called SSNC. So we recorded this re- interview a few weeks ago. We wanted to a- issue it out on AO On Air, so this, this episode is going to be a pre-recorded version, but it's a very good content, two senior operations leaders uh, sharing their experiences and their challenges and opportunities opportunities, uh, both around active ops and just in general. So I hope you'll enjoy meeting with Tom and Chris. And, and as always, you can find other episodes of AO on Air on our YouTube channel at AOTV, or you can go to pod, your favorite podcast channel. Thanks so much. Welcome to AO on Air. This is a podcast from Active Ops, allowing us to present you topics ranging from operations management, leadership, technology, and new innovations. Check out all our episodes on YouTube channel AOTV or with your favorite podcast platforms such as Apple or Spotify. Now let's begin. Hello and welcome to AOTV from ActiveOps. And today's is a special broadcast uh, sponsored with SSNC, one of our partners, and we partnered together with Intelligent Automation and our workforce management solutions to, live, to deliver uh, resilient organizations and operations. So uh, excited to welcome two guests today. It's, it's, it's going to be a good conversation because we have two experienced leaders here. Christopher Matz, Vice President uh, Participant Services from AIG Retirement Services, and Tom Frasina, the Head of Card Services at TD Bank. Welcome, gentlemen. Good morning. Good to be here. Excellent. Well, why don't we get started? Because I, I mentioned who you are, I guess. Uh, but why don't we start with a little deeper introduction, uh, Christopher? If you wouldn't mind just telling us a little bit about you and your role at AIG. Sure. So I oversee what you said was participant services. So AIG Retirement Services services retirement plans for employer groups, predominantly in the K through twelve space, nonprofit, uh, hospitals, and governmental sectors. Uh, And my group processes all the transactions related to that. So participants in their employer's plans, uh, loans, withdrawals, putting money into the plan. Uh, My teams service all that as well as a call center facility. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you, Christopher, for joining us from Houston. And Tom, welcome. Could you tell us a little bit about more about yourself? Absolutely. So um, as you said, in my intro, I work for uh, TD Bank. Um, on, on the on the U.S. side of the business, um, and it, I work in the credit card business, running the operations for our credit card businesses and our private label sales finance side. Um, so, running the operations entails, you know, a number of call centers as well as a number of back office functions as well. Excellent, excellent. So, thank you both for joining, Christopher. Why don't we dig a little bit deeper into that landscape? You mentioned a call center. You mentioned some back office operations there. Can you tell us a little bit more about the teams uh, that you have and 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 kind of the I don't know if it's priorities or, or just their, their, their daily routines or their monthly outputs or what, just anything about your organization that might be interesting for us. Sure. Since we're tied to retirement services and, and annuities and mutual funds, uh, our teams are processing things that typically are driven by market activity. So when markets are crazy, we're crazy. Uh, people are moving money around constantly. We process transactions on over 2 million participants annually. Uh, so that can be anything, like I said, from moving from one fund to another. If you participate in your own uh, employer plan with a 401k or a 403b, then you probably have some understanding of, of what that looks like. Uh, we process movement of money when an entire group is moving into us too, or an entire group is moving away from us. Uh, And everything is typically driven by the same day type of transaction because we have to play the markets according to what the person is requesting of the movement of money. So how we track that and staying on top of that and watching those volumes move throughout the day, uh, just watching the patterns. Interestingly enough, I would tell you, though, that what we do is actually pretty predictable um, because if you look at the historical trends of how markets move uh, and where key days are in the movement, ends of quarters, beginning of the year, tax time, things like that. We can predict pretty well globally what's going to happen, but it's really that day-to-day that we're trying to watch um, as as movement goes. Uh, you know, the, the Fed announces something and all of a sudden people want to move their money to a safer or a uh, you know, depending on what they announce, I guess, to a safer haven or potentially a more risky haven, uh, right. depending on what's going on in the market space. So our teams are doing that. Uh, there's a coordination directly between what uh, occurs in our call center and what's happening uh, in our processing side. Uh, folks can process their own transactions online, but ultimately they're going through our teams 
to audit, quality check, make sure things are, are moving appropriately. Uh, and based on what's happening, they could be calling into the call center because it's not moving as fast as they thought it was. Uh, and then we see, you know, also historical patterns around things like taking loans out of the plan. So uh, most people are taking money out of their plan and usually about this time, starting into the end of July, beginning of August. Uh, it's a trick question. I always like to ask people why they think uh, people are taking money out. It doesn't seem logical. You would think people are taking out at the end of the year to, to pay for the holidays and not. But it's typically because they're taking out money to pay for tuition for their uh. children, their grandchildren and whatnot. So it's actually one of our busiest times of year. Uh, most people, if you were they were talking to me, they would say, what's your busy time of year? And it depends on when you're talking to me because there's always some reason something's busy right at that time. Yeah, um, but right now we're moving into that season. We had we had a slight lull in the summer, people going on vacation and that, uh, and because we are in through in the education space, uh, kind of a little bit of a lull coming out of the end of the school year. But it picks right back up, like I said, right now where folks are starting to pay tuition. Excellent, very interesting. And Tom, tell us a little bit more about Card Services and what your teams are doing there. Sure. So you know, similar to Chris in a different industry in the credit cards, you know. Um, in my side, biggest piece is a private label credit card business, you know, side. So, you know, people go to, a, 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 like, for example, a furniture store and they want to finance buying a couch, a new living room set or whatever. That's my team. So on one end of my team, you know, it's the acquisition piece of the call center is actually helping the merchant acquire the customer. Most times, 8, 90 percent of the time, this is kind of like a lights out. We're not involved at all. We only get involved if something goes wrong. Customer has a referral. Customer, you know, got approved for a certain amount, but they want... 5,000 more because they want it all leather. My team will come in and try to intervene on that piece. So that's probably, you know, on the call center side, one of our key introductions to the customer. And then we have pretty much a regular customer service team as well. So this is after the customer has already set up their account. You know, hey, I want to make a payment. I want to change my address. Your normal customer service standards and things like that. Um, because, for example, in that business, I also it's a partnership business. I also now have another team that's customer service for our partners. So the partner might say, hey, I just sent you 25 sales. When do I get credit for those? I need more brochures, things like that. So I have those teams running. Um, but also, too, I have back offices for both this team as well as our generic um, kind of you know, general general purpose Visa card. Um, so they're dealing with lots of different things. You know, a, a lot of them are regulatory in this back office group. You know, it could be like a credit bureau dispute. It could be a merchandise dispute. It could be a fraud dispute uh, and a number of things like that. So they're doing a lot of that. Um, a lot of our systems, you know, we are looking at some investments now. We're, we're still a bit more manual than I would like in the back end. And especially in the front end, a lot of the stuff does flow down to this team to kind of solve for my group there. Uh, and similar to Chris, we do have some normal seasonalities. I can tell you, like, our merchandise students get a little bit higher after one of our big retailers um, will have a major sale or a new product. We, for example, have the Samsung thing, and they tend to do big phone launches. So we'll tend to get more issues after a launch, just normal, because you just, you just, you've just increased the volume by 300% for a couple of weeks. So you're going to push it all the way through. Um, so, yeah, we can kind of see those patterns, too. But also things change, as Chris said, too, you know. You know, um, for example, mortgage rates going down during the pandemic and people looking at refinancing, a lot of folks started getting, you know, looking at their credit bureau reports and saying, I don't remember being late with TD back in 2014. So they had opened up a dispute. Right. We saw a huge amount of those things as people apply for credit and cleaning things up. So those volumes really jumped up. Now they're coming a bit down to earth. And now that the refinance boom is done, that knock on effect us has actually started to lower those volumes. So, yeah, we'll go through some normal, you know, fluctuations like that on our partnership business or just how consumers are behaving in general. You know, certain times of the year, certain times of the economy, too, they're right on any kind of fee or anything. They want to get the question if they want to get it back. People feeling a little more flush, you get less of that. Too. Yeah. 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 Well, and since this podcast is or is, is kind of about uh, some of the technology, I'm, obviously, I'm with a technology company. Uh, Tom, could we just start with you? What what uh, what solutions are you using from Active Ops or SSNC? Um, we're using, uh, and again, this is my, you know, we're using what I have considered workwear. I launched first, the first time I launched AOM was back in 2011, so I still call it workwear. So we're primarily using that. Like I said, we have some technology um you know, upgrades that we're looking to do. So almost all of, all of our things are manually entered. We don't have any automatic feeds or anything like that. And again, that's on our side. But yeah, we use workwear primarily in our back office groups as well. And then, yeah. uh, you know, we, my first team I launched was back in late 2019. Uh, and then when I inherited a new team in early 21, they launched as well. So yeah, we're using the workwear tool. 
Yeah, yeah. And Christopher, I think you're you're relatively new to ActiveOps, but you've been a SS and C customer for some number of years. Uh, could you share with us what your what what technologies you're using, and 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 I think you've you've kind of taken it a step further with integration strategies. So maybe just a little bit about the landscape there. Yeah, we have. Uh, so likewise, we're using the uh, part of ActiveOps that is managing the capacity based on information we're ingesting from many internal systems. Uh, we actually use a lot of legacy systems, so the data around uh, time and attendance, processing time, um, just the, the what we call the width, the work in progress, the number of items, those are all actually being integrated through efforts that SSNC has helped us with to uh, develop those feeds into the ActiveOps tool. Then ActiveOps takes that information and digests it back to our uh, management group so that they can see and plan for the uh, incoming work that we expect in the next day, the next week, uh, and actually finding capacity throughout the organization where we can shift resources. Um, you know, maybe our lockboxes are running late that day, but we've got a team that didn't get as much volume and we can now visually see that in the active ops tool. But that's all coming from uh, right now, we do a daily push automatically, if you will, into the system of all the data. Um, we're working on the APIs right now with SSNC to make that a, a constant feed into it so that it's immediate, real time. Um, but it actually was a growing point for our management group because they felt it was important that they needed to see it real time, but we had to have the conversation around them that really ActiveOps is about planning and knowing kind of what's out in front of you. Yeah. So once a day is sufficient to get us uh, what we need, Obviously, it'll just give them a little more comfort level if we can get it down to the, you know, the, the constant feed of information coming sure. out of all our systems. So everything, like I said, from our uh, workday system, attendance system, uh, our meeting calendars, uh, you name it, we're feeding that information into ActiveOps so that our management group can see where capacity exists in the organization. And, and Christopher, from the SS&C side, are you, you're using the intelligent automation or the, uh, the BPM solution, is that right? So that's what we're migrating to. Uh, okay. Yeah, so uh, SSNC for our company on a broader basis does some of the hosting. So they already have access to okay. a lot of our systems and data and whatnot. So they're a resource that helps us, uh, although we have our own internal resources, as in any big organization, typically your internal resources are at, in limited supply and focused on many other efforts. We always have a lot going on. So it's been great to have the SSNC resources because they tend to be um, pretty available for us um, when we need something either modified or adapted. And they actually approached us and said, hey, we're already managing these servers and data for you. We think we can do this faster and, and set it up. So uh, that's uh, the where they've integrated with us right now. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you both for that landscape of the technology. Uh, let's let's kind of go back to the uh, the operations a bit for each of you. And Tom, we'll start with you. I mean, we've come through some strange years. We may have choppy waters ahead with the economy and inflation and things like that. Um, if you were to to describe two or three challenges that your operation sees ahead of you, I mean, what what are what are they? What's upcoming, or what are you, what are your teams focused on? Um, I think you know. I think we have gotten through. You know, now that we're two and a half plus years into this piece, you know, I think it's working quite well for this work from home thing. And we actually have moved to a completely work at home model. So um, it's working better. I mean, there's a lot of our numbers across the board, both the call centers and the outbreaks have seen better attendance rates, better, better retention of staff. So everything in service levels, everything is, is kind of like blaring green, which is really good. Um, having said that, I am still a little bit worried because We've never been in this landscape before. So my fear is like, is this just the beginning of the ride? Is it going to get a little rocky? What happens if something change? Again, staff are very happy and everything else like that. So we're good. I think one of the, one of the things we just have as a team is just trying to feel out where people are and how they're feeling. I mean, our people scores are among the best we've ever had in our organization. Uh, and usually operational teams don't beat staff organizations. And we did. We led the organization. So Almost too good to me. So sometimes I get just a little bit nervous when everything's running too well. Yeah. You know, I always feel there's something around the corner. I think the other thing, too, is we, I talked earlier about, um, you know, some of the changes in the economy and things like that. So that will, our business actually, especially in the private label sales unit, actually, we did very well during COVID. We happened to be in sectors of the economy where consumers couldn't do things like vacations, go out to dinner. That hurt our general purpose credit cards a bit. But in our other sectors... We finance furniture. Well, people decide, like, I need to set up a workspace in my home, or I'm not going on vacation, I'm redoing the living room. Um, 
lawn and garden equipment, right? We're not going anywhere. We're going to go spruce up the yard, things like that. We had electronics. We also had a uh, fitness company that sold fitness equipment. They're down a little bit now, but they were up like two, three hundred percent almost constantly through the pandemic. So now the economy is kind of coming the other way. People a little bit more cautious. I mean, we're still hitting sales. If we had looked out three or four years in the behind, where we thought we would be, but we had just been gangbusters for the last couple of years. So some of those numbers are coming down to earth. And I think there's some consumer confidence, you know, that could be changing. And that does have some effects on my offices and what volumes are coming in. I think the biggest change is, you know, it's again, the, some really good things are going to be coming down our path as we look to invest in new systems and things like that. And a real big push to get customers more digital. But I also say that leaves me at a different thing. The staff I have today will not be the staff I need tomorrow. And I'm not talking just purely about numbers of staff. I'm talking more about today a lot of my staff do, and I don't want to make this a negative term, but they do Clark-like functions, right? You know, something broke, they put it back on the assembly line. They just kind of move things. In the future, the system should do almost all of that. My folks would be more consultants, right? A customer has an issue or concern. So instead of following a checklist or things like that, again, the system's going to handle all the easy stuff. The hard stuff is going to be what's left. So how do I really change my workforce out to be able to meet those challenges? And again, it's not going to be a light switch. It's not going to be, you know, one day we have this and one day we have the other. We're going to be evolving with multiple systems. So my biggest challenge is looking at the staffing I have today to get them up trained to help that and to recruit people with a bit of a different mindset as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And Chris, what do, what do you think about challenges? Yeah, yeah, I was going to say that's interesting, Tom, because I think because you had active ops in place probably prior to the pandemic, we actually deployed it during the pandemic. Okay. So, it's helped us evolve through this, but um, it's interesting kind of that you wrapped up on staffing because I would say that that is such a, a big factor for us right now in staffing. So what AgriOps has really helped us do uh, as we deployed it more or less at the end of last year, beginning of this year, was really understand where our staffing is. We actually, from a management group, had really good insight into our data and how things were moving through the system, but we felt like we probably had some lost productivity simply because of the distractions at home and people logging on at different times. And so what the tool has been able to really help us do though, is really help our staff understand that in a way that we can now create shifts that meets their needs. So people that don't want to log on until 10 o'clock in the morning because they got to get their kids off to school or something where before they just got up and left the house and who knows what was going on at the home or whatever. We're able to do some of that shift work better with the tool. We can see that better and we've been able to spread that out uh, in a more efficient way for our group. But I think the things we're looking at is continuing to look at how we can do that, how we can share resources, how we can spread the shifts, change the shifts. I have employees in four primary locations, three domestically and one internationally. So better understanding that and understanding the skill levels in those different locations where we are. Um, also, I, mean, I don't think it's anything unique to us. You're probably seeing the same thing, Tom, but just finding resources in today's market is very, very challenging. Um, and, you know, in the old world, People decided on whether they're going to take a new job based on where they had to commute to. Now it's, you know, how quick can I pack up my laptop and get my new one up and running? Uh, and that's pretty simple to do these days. So uh, it's very competitive out there. Um, we're seeing turnover. Um, we're seeing this. And I've talked to many people in many different industries. And I think we're all against the same challenges right now. So that's really where our focus is. I think the other interesting thing that we're trying to focus on is that, you know, when the pandemic started, and I hate to make this about the pandemic, yeah. this is the world we live in now, and you got to make sure that you're operating in the current environment, regardless of what that is. Um, but when we did, it was, uh, oh, we're going to be back, you know, started in March, we're going to be back in the office in June, oh, then we're going to be back in the office in September. Here we are more than two years later, and this just is what it is. And when we were thinking it would be short term, the focus was on the employee and were they comfortable and were they situated and how do they work and do they have the technology and all that. And I think we lost sight of the management group of that. Um, and so we're starting to shift some of that. And from the perspective of all of our managers managed in a physical location. They manage by walking around. Operations is very much about walking up to a person's desk. They raise their hand. They need some help. Or if you're in a call center, I need somebody over at my desk uh, and, and those types of things. And we didn't really focus on that because we thought, okay, we just got to get past these next couple of months and then they'll all be back in the office. Well, this is the world we live in now. And I think we need to shift our focus a little bit towards 
our managers and how do you manage people remotely? And so, again, I see where ActiveOps is really helping us do that because they can have more, they know where to focus their time on a team's call or who to spend more time on their one-on-one based on what they're seeing in the data that they're able to extrapolate out of the, the ActiveOps tools that we are using. Yeah, so that's where I think a big part of our focus will be in the in the coming year too is on the management side of that. Yeah, that's a good observation. Yeah. I'm sorry, Tom. Go ahead. I was just say Chris, that's a good point. I mean, um, while I said we've been doing better with attrition, FCC, and everything else, I didn't say it was easy to hire people. <laughs> we're probably double or triple, you know, the amount of time to get the right person in. But you're right. We did launch prior to the pandemic, um, so I think it was very helpful in my back office that once we had to go remote, and we were lucky. My back office, I had deployed laptops to all the staff. The prior year, just because we had some ridiculous kind of offsite, you know, redundancy, which I said would never work. It was pay, I was every year I was paying more than a laptop, so that we were able to switch pretty quick. But the workwear was how we, you know, we started to replace the management by working around, which I think is essential. I always did, but you know what? It also was there was always somebody who said they were really busy at their desk and they had tons of paper. Didn't mean they really were that busy or they had that much work. So workwear is kind of the unvarnished truth. So that has helped us. A great deal with this. And you're right, it's a new way of working. You know, my one site in North, primary back office site was in northern New Jersey. So if I had a little bit of overtime that I needed, I told people, hey, can you come in on a Saturday morning? They look at me like, I am not driving like an hour of traffic to go give you an hour and a half. But if you're home on a Saturday morning and your kid's soccer game doesn't start till 10, they might jump on the computer for a couple of hours and go to the game. So it's really been a great kind of, we've been able to get a lot more productivity when we need it. And not when we don't. And again, same thing as you said, right? We've been able to look at shifts, look at work, either move people shifts if they want to work early in the morning and we can cop it and we have the work coming in or we need to get the work out the door at the right times. That works for us. Um, and also, too, as we said, we had, I said earlier, for example, we had a change with, you know, with the economy and people looking at their credit bureaus and needing a lot more. We quickly saw a reduction in some of our other areas. So we quickly moved those down, had them retrained. And we kind of got that heads up fairly quickly by using the workwear tools versus waiting to the end of the month and saying, oh, yeah, I guess we were busy here. We knew that day versus, you know, with having real numbers versus getting that, you know, waiting for the end of the month. So it, it, it really has been, continues to be a very valuable resource for us. Again, on my call center side, you know, I always argue in the call center, I have, you know, the last hour, I would take me weeks to go through all the data that it could produce me to look at. We never had that in the back office, and that's what workwear has really made a big difference for us. Yeah, just curious, curious, Chris. Are you? Uh, uh, Tom mentioned he's 100% home office. So what is AIG's situation or retirement services situation? Yeah, so retirement services is optional. You can come into an office, so you can stay at home. If you're coming into the office, you have to provide proof of vaccination. Um, I'm sitting in our offices today, and I'm probably the only person in the building today. I mean, again, if you're given the option, I can understand why folks, particularly, it's interesting, our, our, our sales folks, I think, you know, some of the stories that I've heard is, is our folks who are out in the field generally were excited about the opportunity to, to get back in the office because that's kind of, you know, the personality that they are to interact and that. And our folks that are in operations are like, no, I never got to be remote. This is, a, you know, great for me to be able to work from home. So, um, but we, we have some folks that take advantage of it. And certainly if they're having technology issues or whatnot, we, they'll come into the office and take advantage of the mm-hmm. tech bar and, and things of that nature. But I wanted to visit something actually that Tom said too about, and it's more related in it from a personal perspective on it, is the type of employee that we're having to manage today in this new environment. And I, I relate it to my personal situation. I have four adult children, but my youngest daughter has only started working in a corporate environment since the pandemic. So she has no concept of employee morale, employee engagement. It's just about she sitting in a home office for two years kind of thing. Yeah. And to her, it's about, I log on in the morning, I log off at night. And so it just is a different mentality of, you know, how people are working and thinking today. And particularly in operations, we turn our turnover relative to other <coughs> segments and whatnot. It's generally high anyway. So yeah. we're starting to see more of those people who, you know, it's not important to them that they come to a pizza party in yeah. the break room or whatever. And so we have to figure out how to, and it goes back to what I was saying before about the management side of it is, so how do you keep those people engaged that literally all they have to do is pack up that laptop to go take a new job? Um, yeah. 
you know, and I see it personally, like I said, with what yeah. my daughter's doing there and how she views the work world versus, you know, a vast majority of the people that I was working with prior to that. Yeah, that's fascinating. If your daughter was called into the office, she might get, might freak out a little bit, huh? <laughs> well, that's interesting. So, Tom, you mentioned something about the, 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 the work is changing and automation has a way of changing the work that your team will be doing. And Chris, I mean, you're using some automation. I mean, how much of that is important when you're trying to recruit talent? Is, is that automation in the type of work that they're engaged with? Is that is that a help you recruit or does it does it doing some manual work help uh, relate to that attrition rate? I, I'm just curious what what technology plays in that skill set. I think, you know, generally people want to do more interesting work. I mean, I, I do a few people on my staff, they just want to plug through and, you know, get a pile of stuff and just plug it through, right? But most people want to be a little bit more engaged. They want to not just be just entering data entering. And I mean, I have a fair amount of people who just basically do some kind of data entering all day manually. Um, so, in, for example, you know, during the thing, you know, we, for example, for a long time used to get like return mail and uh, we had to get a solution because it used to come in boxes. So now, it, now we finally got an image and then we finally said, look, there are other solutions you can get from the post office and scanning that the system will change the address for you. So those, we had a few people there and, you know, they went to go work in our fraud department. So they went from a very basic skill thing. And, you know, they've come back pretty much to one saying, well, this is a much better day, right? I'm not just sitting here with a pile of envelopes that I've got to get through either physically or, or virtually. I really enjoy this fraud work. Now, even that is somewhat formulaic in how they do it, but it's at least a little bit more interesting than just changing addresses for eight hours a day. Yeah. So it does change the profile of the person we look at. And like I said... You know, our evolution is going to be a lot different. I even see, for example, my phone teams, right? If I, have, if I have most of the phone calls that we get are pretty basic things, make a payment, change an address. As more of that gets digitized and all that, the questions that are going to be left are either going to be one where the customers have a really tougher problem. So I really want to hire people who are more consulting kind of tools. I look at my credit side. What I look to do more is, you know, we, you know, to some degree, we have some hard breaks, right? If you're below this number you don't get approved if you're above this number you do well i would like to set up more of a you know kind of a gray area when i have the availability once i have the right people trained giving a little more training saying look yeah i know your score is below what our normal thing is but the system's going to send it to me and i'm going to do some work and see if i can't get that to an approval right so instead of declining it today because it's just one number one one digit below the, the cutoff score maybe we look at anything 20 20 points below the cutoff score and see what we can do. So, yeah, that's our big challenge. We actually had yeah. some meetings. Um, the first meetings we all got together as a group in, in more than two years just to talk about how the, that piece of the journey on the people is really going to change. And again, I think a lot of the folks that we have today, we can bring with us on a journey. Maybe not everyone, um, but also, too, we have to start hiring people, not yet, but soon, who have those ability to adapt to those skills. But we have to outline what those skills look like and when they're going to come into play. Yeah. Yeah. How about you, Chris? Yeah, so I think for us, technology is an interesting dynamic in what we do. Uh, we actually have a significant amount of technology as part of our processes. Uh, we use bots to do a lot of the processing. Uh, on the front end, we're using things like hyperscience to, to read paper forms and read signatures and things of that nature. So that, that presents two challenges. And Tom, I think you touched upon this a little bit. First of all, the more you can automate that simple stuff, the more the difficult stuff is what you need the humans for. So you do have a different profile, but it also requires conversations throughout the organization because you know, a lot of times operations was about handle time. And you talk about in call centers, it's handle times and how fast you can process things. Well, the more you get the simple things out of the noise, you actually start seeing your handle times going yeah, up. Right, so right, right. there's a lot of conversation about, oh my gosh, what's going on in operations? Why is it taking longer and all of that? And so you have to explain that to folks. Well, the stuff we're seeing now is more of the challenging stuff. Um, and I think what we do is uh, we see kind of some cause and effect there too. You start to see quality actually coming down because now they can actually focus on the difficult stuff. They weren't trying to get the easy stuff through and distracted mm -hmm. and all of that. So there is, you know, some definite upside. I would say the other downside, though, um, not necessarily as a negative, but we've had instances where the technology breaks or doesn't work that particular day. And so then I have to have the conversations. As I was mentioning, we're tied to markets. So yeah. we have a concept of lag and gain. If you don't get processed by that particular close of the market, you kind of have to make the person whole. And that comes out of our pockets <clears throat> as a company to make sure that that happens and whatnot. 
Well, if all of a sudden 30 of your robots got to go down if we're doing the work of 70, 80 some people, I don't have 70, 80 people sitting around to, to kind of fill the gap on that. So, you know, you have to have contingency plans around that. You have to have an understanding of what is that impact. Obviously, it's a bigger picture scope. So while that could be a big impact on a single day, you kind of look at it annually. And yeah, the, the bots were processing enough work annually that even though we may have had a significant uh, a loss or gain in that particular day, it makes up for it in, in, a, in a big picture type environment. But those are the challenges of, you can't just let it sit there. That's when we do kind of call hands on deck to do some overtime. And I do think it's on your right. I mean, I hear more frequently people who will say, well, I have to log off between five and seven because I got to get the family dinner, but I'll log back on between <clears> seven and 10. Wouldn't have had that before. In fact, they would have kind of been sitting in the office looking at their watches needing to get out by six or seven o'clock. And so I do think we get more quality overtime from them. Um, and what ActiveOps has actually helped us do is, is we've, it's successfully seen since we deployed a decrease in our overtime because we've been able to figure out where we can get them their effective eight hours of work in for the day or seven and a half hours and whatnot. So even though in the scheme of things, it looks like they're working overtime, they're really not because we're able to better see where that work is in the process and whatnot. Excellent. Yeah, we we seen that early on with the before the pandemic, right? You had pockets of people working all the time, and pockets of other groups that were just kind of waiting for work. Especially if you had, we had certain areas where I was waiting for you to finish your work, Chris, so I could do my work. So my team's not busy, so I'm kind of twiddling my thumbs, and all of a sudden I get this tsunami the next day. Now you're not as busy, so yeah, that that, that really in a couple of places I've deployed AOM. Uh, yeah, we we've oh, those always are kind of like quick wins, and, and the thing that really made a difference to the manager's understanding. And it's not that pe- people like kind of had that like, well, Doug, why didn't I figure that out? Well, because you're in the middle of doing a million other things, and you're just not going to see it until the numbers really just kind of you know slap you across the face with that. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a great point, Tom, because historically we we could see it, but it was usually too late because the old kind of capacity management was Excel spreadsheets or after the fact information right. where the active ops tool, the way that it ingests the information, it kind of is telling you in advance, this is coming, get ready kind of thing. And so mm-hmm. we're able to see that a little better, um, the way that the tool functions for us. So. Excellent. Yeah, my, my best story on that was I deployed this in the UK the first time I had this back in 2011, 2012. One of my managers, good back office operations manager, she was a little bit more reluctant to do this. And she'd been around a while, so she had seen things like this come and go. Um, and I don't know, six weeks, eight weeks into it, you know, um, it was a big, big building we had. She's kind of grabbing the hallway. She goes, oh, my God, I finally understand. I'm like, what's going on? She goes, well, I had a part timer and she used to sort mail. She came in Monday, Wednesday, Friday. But Monday, you know, we had no mail. Mail tended to come in Monday afternoon, Tuesday. So on Wednesday, she couldn't get enough done. You know, Friday, she was okay. And then Monday, she was quiet again. But then her downstream tools, as I just said earlier, they were getting fluctuations because we just adjusted her schedule to kind of come into half a day on Monday. You know, Monday, we cut up Monday. We had to work Tuesday and Wednesday and Friday. And it's amazing what we've done. But that was with a light bulb moment that for that one manager, once she saw that connection, everything worked for her that she couldn't have been the biggest advocate after that. Excellent. That's actually been one of the biggest advantages for us too, since we deployed, we, we had a culture of capacity management and looking at workflow. There's no doubt about that, but I don't know that we had a lexicon or language around it. And because we now have deployed and gotten everybody kind of on the same page of what you should be looking at, we all talk about it in the same way. Yep. Whereas uh. teams have their own Excel spreadsheets or their own tools or their own workforce management mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. kind of thing. By deploying this kind of as a bridge across everything, everybody talks in the same way now. And so when we yep. talk about the uh, load meetings and uh, uh, huddles and all of that, it really, as I like to say, it took the drama out of the conversations. So it wasn't so much about the people um, now, as it is about the work, and so whether it's a one-on-one you're having, you can you can have an intelligent conversation with the employee about what their challenges are for the day or whatnot, mm-hmm. because it's all about the data. Everybody's looking at the same tool. The employee can see it, the managers can see it, yeah. um, and that's really kind of how we pivoted as an organization. It's not like we were a mess before this. In fact, I I think we did a phenomenal job of managing. Right based on what we had. But once we deployed, it kind of started getting everybody, those light bulbs going off that you were talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And and like you said, Chris, like it was funny for all those years, you know, 
we did involve the people who were doing the work. Generally, it was something I did, or like a, I'd have a, you know a finance person and some of the managers versus the people who actually did the work could make the switch off. So yeah, load meetings. I used to just love sitting in the back and just kind of watching them. I've watched a few of them virtually. They come up with their own solutions and solve it. It's just when it, when it, when it gets going, they get used to it, like you said, and they know the terminologies. And then you bring several teams together. It's just it just it's a thing of art. It's just seamless how they talk through things. That's excellent. Excellent. Thank you both for those stories. That's, it's amazing how uh, I think the vo- vocabulary and, and the, uh, across two different organizations seems to be uh, in sync there, even though you guys have just met for this, for this recording. So it's interesting. I, I'm curious, and it doesn't have to be about the tech, although it can be if you want. Uh, I, you both are senior ops leaders, and you've, you've been in the roles that have uh, led a lot of people, led a lot of challenges, uh, a lot of, lot of transactions, as you both described today. Um, if you were going to sit down over a cup of coffee with a, with a young operation, leader maybe could you share you know a bit of advice for for them I, 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 either of you can start Chris to, Christopher if you want to start yeah so um, I'd love to say uh, you know make sure that you know how to do what that operational work is that you're trying to manage or that you're trying to to uh, lead others in um, and that isn't necessarily that you know how to process a loan or you know how to process a death claim if I'm using you know our business or something like that but you have to have a general understanding because it's you know you can't just come in and manage the people um, and so taking that time you know I've been on the other side too of a sales organization and it was something that I required all of my salespeople to do was spend a few weeks in home office with operations and just go from desk to desk to desk, just so you could have an appreciation for what the day in the life was, because it's, you know, and and even in this business, I still hear it and I certainly understand it. You know, why did you make that mistake? Or why can't you get this right? Or, you know, you know, whether it's a customer complaining or one of our internal customers asking that question and you have to have an appreciation for there's nobody coming in every day that doesn't want to do it right, but they are constrained by systems and technology and you know all of those types of things and sometimes it just doesn't work like they'd like it to work and it's not a matter of them rushing or not understanding and those types of things and i think if you have that appreciation as a a new leader take a month take two months and just literally sit with people if you've got a call center sit there and listen to the calls that are coming in just hear that we often talk about it on the operations side. I always say in bits and bytes, you know, it's, it's very technical, but you got to be able to talk about it in just regular people language kind of thing. So if you sit on phone calls, um, you can hear that. You can get an appreciation for that. Um, I think that that's for me personally, what's made me a stronger leader is just kind of stepping back and forgetting about the leadership part and really feel for what they're going through on a day to day basis and really put that effort into doing that. Excellent, excellent. Good, very good advice, Tom. What would you What would you have over coffee with a young leader? Sure. I mean, I definitely do what Chris does. Right. That's the first thing we do. People come on board. I might bore them a bit, but I bring them through where we are, why we do what we do, and the history too. That's also important because people are like, why are we doing this? Well, I'll explain to you why. Right. Here's what the evolutions were, and here's what we got here, and things like that. So yeah, I, I believe in that. Even myself, when I take over a new organization, I want to understand. I don't want to necessarily process that fraud claim, but I want to know, hey, what are the most important things we're trying to get done here? Why are we trying to get it done? You know, and all those things too. So at least I have an appreciation of explaining it to somebody else. Uh, But the other thing too, it's funny, you know, I just actually had to prepare. Um, We had a bunch of college interns come through and they asked me to do a presentation to them. And I I don't know what everyone else was doing, but I actually decided to do one that was a little bit different. I was saying, you know, preparing for the unknown. And I kind of compared two events. One was Y2K and one was the pandemic. Um, first thing I had to understand was when I did this, that none of these new college teachers <laughs> knew what Y2K was. <laughs> they weren't born yet. So I had to do a little thing like, you know, back in the day we had, you know, computers had about as much power. You know, the entire world was about the size of your iPhone when it came to computer power. And, you know, we had to do these things. But I explained to them, like, there's two different ways of approaching, you know, the unknowns. When you're in operations, these things are going to happen. I says, the Y2K, for example, was an, an, something that we knew was going to happen, but we didn't know what the effects were. So we came up with lots of game plans and how we would, if this happens, do this. So I remember I had binders of books and for the most part, they didn't have to go because we did a good job preparing for it. I said, but the pandemic was the opposite. It was kind of like, boom, it was on our doorsteps. Like, yeah, I mean, I started talking a couple of weeks earlier about it, but it was there. We had to solve it on the points. I said, you got to be ready for these two types of problems. The ones that you know that are going to come and the ones that you don't know are going to come. And I says, now it might seem a little crazy. I said, but you know what? 
you can pull a lot of other things in. I said, you know, I remember back in 2009, there was a flu, the swine flu was coming. They were really worried about this coming in and how we'd manage ops. We didn't have a lot of good answers because we did not have the ability to have people go home at remote. People didn't have the industry. Luckily, that didn't happen. But I remember like some of the things I thought about then, I thought about again, you know, 11 years later. Um, so I really try to principal lead is like always thinking about, you know, and that's kind of maybe going back to what I said, things are too good now. I'm trying to think, okay, what else could go wrong? <laughs> always examining, never be satisfied. Try to kick the things around, see what more you can do to improve to improve the operations. Look for any faults or anything else that could catch you. Because today it might be a defect that happens one in a million, but who knows if the volume changer is, you know, Chris said a robot change is now that's now hitting you every 10 times. Yeah. And how yeah. would you survive that? So just really keeping your head open around the landscape. And as we said during this call, like there's not just what happens at work or in your own business, but what's happening in other industries that try to keep close with peers, things like this are great. Even if they're not exactly in my industry, and that's fine. I can actually, you know, we get blind in our own industry, actually hearing stories from other industries actually triggers things in my mind as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, I love that point because, and I love what your presentation was about because I think I would add to that too. Uh, don't be afraid to fail in operations. Yeah. You're going to fail anyways. Just fail mm -hmm. fast. Don't think you're going to have even with ActiveOps. I mean, that was one of the things we had to add, educate leaders about. You're never going to have 100% perfect data, and if you're going to wait for that, you're you're going to be waiting away for forever. Yeah. So be afraid, don't be afraid. Take the chances. Just pivot when you something comes up that you didn't expect, and you know use the data and learn from it, and just move on from it. Because yeah. in operations, things are constantly changing yeah. for us. And and like you said, there's going to be the unexpected, and there's going to be the expected, and you just got to learn from it and move fast. So. Excellent. What's interesting about that to me, kind of sitting here listening to you guys, you, you talked about, uh, Christopher talked about the kind of the anatomy of the operation, get to know it, understand it, know it. And then Tom talked about be prepared. And you can't do one without the other, right? You, you have to know the operation so you can be prepared for the unexpected or the expected. So thank you very much. We appreciate your, your expertise and, and your experience. And thank you. I've taken a lot of your time this morning. I really appreciate you both spending spending time with us. Any any final comments or any uh, anything that we left out of the discussion that you want to hit on? No? For me? Okay. Yeah, appreciate Excellent. Well, Pretty same here. Well, I'm glad we also could introduce the two of you guys, because even though you don't live in the same area, you're in the same operation, it seems like. Yeah. Very much, very much appreciate. Thank you for your time. To everybody listening, uh, please share this video with your colleagues, because there's a lot of useful information here. We want to thank uh, SSNC, and if you're interested in learning more about SSNC, please go to their website at SSNC.com. If you're interested in learning more about ActiveOps, go to ActiveOps.com. We appreciate everybody's attention, and have a great day. Thank you very much.